Hi, well 40 minutes to address how to get the best out of staff. It's going to feel like intravenous whiskey and gin straight into our veins to get through it, which actually I think is not a bad idea after the last session because <laughs> oh, I'm sort of going, right, how do we feel good about ourselves as a sector? My goodness, lots of challenges, but we're used to challenges um, and, and staff can often be one of the challenges. Um, so thank you for the intro, Richard. Um, just as I said, just working through background and consultancy. Career highlight though was my five years with Lone Star Farms. Uh, when I arrived there, there was 10 farms, uh, all pretty much operating as silos. So you'd have a boomer season happening in Otago and they'd be selling all their lambs. Meanwhile, drought in Canterbury and they weren't communicating, the farm managers wouldn't talk, seven wouldn't talk to the other three. So both farms were selling lambs off or buying in from outside rather than internally. Uh, no culture, company hugely in the red. So the five years uh, with them was really about building a whole new culture, uh, starting with what did we want to be as a company and, and those that were on board, did they want to be part of that um, or not? And sometimes people aren't on the right bus and, and that's okay, and there's always other buses leaving from different terminals. So, um, yeah, we, we went through a little bit of that. So just to get started, keen to know who's in the room. So could you put your hand up if you are an employer of staff? So you've got staff at the moment. Okay, awesome. Who here is a staff member or an employee working for somebody? Yeah, so some people have got two, two hats on. Hands up if you have had some positive experiences with your staff in the last six months or with your boss in the last six months. Well, that's a relief. <laughs> uh, likewise, hands up if you've had some challenges in the last six months with staff. Again. And for the farmers in the room, hands up if you went into farming because you wanted to manage people. <laughs> this is a, a major sort of part of our career development that we probably didn't plan for and don't always want, um, but through often success of growing your careers and growing your businesses, that's where we find ourselves. So quite challenging. So I just want to take uh, two minutes for you to talk to the person next to yourself. Um, if you already know them and you think, hey, he's not that interesting, um, feel free to shift seats. But <laughs> quite keen for you to just talk to each other about what has been a positive moment with one of your staff in the last few months. Just recall a positive moment. And if not with staff, with your boss, perhaps, if you've got a boss. Do you know, it was awesome standing up here and seeing the smiling faces. So really nice to reflect on some of the positives that are happening with our staff. If someone out of your peer or your group did share a story, I want that person to identify what was it that you had done or did to make that positive experience happen for your staff member. What did you consciously do to make that happen? Maybe time to review your, your relationship or the activity. P 
putting time aside to actually think about it. Awesome. Someone else, what had you done or what did you do to make that experience happen for your staff member? In the back there? It just happened because the manager left the personal circumstances. Mm -hmm. So he just stepped up? Yeah, he did. And what did you do to help support him step up? I went to, I went to his farm and I helped out and I, uh, I left him the song for himself as well. And they gave him a treatment, they gave him a salary. So. Awesome. Yeah. I'd appreciate that. You know, I know, Scott, something they've reflected on for themselves that you actually consciously did to create that positive experience. Yeah, awesome. So you saw his potential and allowed the opportunity. Those three examples that you've shared really are tools in our toolkit. Taking time with staff and thinking about staff to make something happen, or whether it's leading from the front and giving people opportunity, or like in the back there, seeing someone's potential, actually recognising their potential and allowing something to be done about it. Challenges. Some people, when they're talking about positives, automatically flew into the challenge leg or some issue that's been happening. So again, quickly, 30 seconds together, one of the challenges with a staff member that's arisen for you in the last couple of months or six months. Talk to your peer. <laughs> that's easy. Right, hands up who's happy to share a challenge. <laughs> Valerie in the front's got a challenge she's happy to share. Oh, particular communication and all that. Right. In a team situation? Yes. Yeah. Hands up where communication is a challenge or an issue in your business. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So our challenge is fairly significant for most people on farm with staff. Yeah, and, and, and that applies in any business, not just in farming, although it can feel a, a fairly lonesome place to be. Um, my grandmother and grandfather, when they were sheep and beef farming in Marlborough, my grandmother used to call my grandfather the hucker master. And one day I was there and granddad was coming in and she went, oh, Jesus, here comes the hucker master. I said, what's the hucker master? She goes, he comes in when he's had a stressful day with staff and goes, oh my God, if this keeps happening, come my dear, come. <laughs> the hacker master, challenges, been there with staff for a long time and, and probably won't go away. The thing with staff management, and because we get there by default, we become people managers by default through growth in our careers and our business, we don't necessarily recognise that it needs to be a conscious thing we do. We consciously need to manage staff. We need to plan for what we're doing with staff, prepare for activities we're doing with staff. Um, no different to stock management and crop management. On a Sunday night or if it's a Friday, whatever day when you're planning your week, 
we add staff management to our list of where's Ben at? Have I actually spent any time with Ben? What might Ben be thinking about? He's been with us for 18 months. What, what's his goals and plans? What have we got on for the week? And do I need to have a conversation with, that, with Ben about how this week's going to really help him get to where he wants to go? Conscious management of staff. Right. Yeah. Sympathetic while mate wanting to curse in your head and go, oh my God, how are we going to fill the gaps? <laughs> yeah, absolutely, because who's left to step in? It's always the boss and the, <laughs> the manager's left to, or the owner. Yep. Sorry, I actually had the... Um, oh. <laughs> um, the health and safety issues on farm today has sort of galvanised us into more um, uh, communication with staff. Yeah. Um, you know, how you feel, what have you found, what are you seeing. Um, you know, you've got to take them through processes all the time and not just one year, um, as the season all comes around, you've got to do it all again. Mm -hmm. And it's not, it's not bad, but it's, it's just part of the process. And I get into trouble because I talk to my staff probably for half an hour every morning. And I say, well, that's probably 10 or 15 bucks gone, but the communication involved in, in that, I, I think there's more positives. Absolutely, and fantastic. Sometimes compliance, well, a lot of the time compliance is a pain in the neck, but there can actually be some real positives, and I completely agree. I've seen health and safety actually bring about positive communication change on farm. Improving how we communicate with staff is going to have to be our biggest return on investment if we're going to implement anything. What do you think the dog's saying to the sheep? <laughs> <laughs> Probably not a lot because they're stone. So that was a bit of a trick question. Um, all of us take on board knowledge, instructions, skills, all in different ways. And so if you've got one or more staff, then we need to think about how do I cater for the needs of my staff member to make sure if I want to give an instruction and ideally that job gets done the way it needs to get done, how do I deliver my messages? Because the way I take on board that instruction is not necessarily the way my staff member takes on board that instruction. And so we have to have a toolkit around staff management and have a few different tools in there that we apply, hopefully meeting the needs of the broad spectrum of our staff. And likewise hopeful that because we're providing information in different ways, that they're also getting the best from us. Because if we provide it in different ways, we get to share what we know and what we want to have happen. I thought it would be really interesting to share this with you, just to help our understanding about how we acquire skills. Because probably one of the number one mistakes I feel we make and that I see happening on farm, is we overestimate staff, skills, abilities, knowledge. We overestimate their capabilities. Likewise, staff can overestimate their own. <laughs> and we see that with the generation coming through. Anyone, children, teenagers, young people, Going to be a manager, six months, tops. Right, well, we are seeing that with the generations come through. There's a higher level of confidence, and I believe some confidence to ability ratios are quite severely out of kilter, but that is what we're working with. Result of? The education system. Ah, 
that's a whole nother session after this one. Don't get me started about NCEA and, and what it's doing for our, our children coming through. This, this opportunity to have three tries at something, you must bring a mob for me. You don't get three goes, right? You've got one go to get it through safely that gate, not muck it up, try again. So, yeah, we're, how are we preparing our people? Anyway, this little Dreyfus model by John Edwards, who's an Australian researcher, into how people acquire skills is, is fascinating. If you take it, let's apply it when we're learning to drive. So think back to when you first got your licence or you were learning to drive. We were down this end as a novice. First time we get in the car, very much a novice. And what this means is that our behaviours need to be rule governed. We needed someone sitting beside us, talking us through how to drive that car. Gear stick, so put it in first, foot slowly off the clutch, rule driven, rule governed, to guide us through safely the new skill we were trying to learn. As we move up and get a little bit of experience, we move into the next phase as beginner. We become competent, proficient, and then potentially an expert. So this is where we track over time. When you become an expert, we call this personal practical knowledge, you're at the top of the game. You could walk into a situation on farm and weigh it up, sum it up, you're drawing on all that experience and know how to deal with it. When you're a novice, you have no context. You don't understand the why. Why are we body condition scoring these ewes? Why are we vaccinating? Why are we drafting off the tail end? Everything that they are doing on farm has no context yet when they've got very little experience to draw on. The more experience they get, the more context they develop because they've seen some situations, they've heard some things now, they get a bit better understanding. And so as we get more experience, obviously we need less rules. We're more able to govern ourselves. Now, hands up in the room who considers themselves an expert in managing Lucerne. I know this girl in the front here is pretty close to expert managing Lucerne. Who would consider themselves proficient? Okay, a few in the room. Who's never dealt with Lucerne before and might consider themselves a novice? Yep. Last night, farm manager rang me. Was, he's been farm manager, he's 45, has been managing for almost 20 years. Recently left his job and is working for another farmer, helping him out with some health and safety stuff and environmental. Chatting away, having uh, some interesting times and what, what he's seeing. He said to me, so describing a situation, he said, jeez, I felt like a bloody novice, I did. Manager, 45 years old, all that experience, calling himself a novice. And it was around merino sheep and having to check their feet. In all his years' experience, he had never, ever had to do that before, had no idea what to look for. But he's working on a farm with owners and what would the owners have been thinking? This guy, surely, they wouldn't even have given it a second thought. He's been a manager. He's 45. Of course he's an expert. We can be experts in specific tasks, but not necessarily all tasks. We can be competent in some tasks, but perhaps not all. So I go back to my point, one of our underlying issues and things we need to investigate with staff is what actually are their skills and capabilities for each task. We have to stop assuming that age and experience makes someone an expert or even competent and proficient at every task we're doing with them on farm. And we have to get brave about checking out their experience to make sure we don't set them up to fail. No, uh, Kerry. 
whose role is it more important than in that situation where the employee obviously has uh, confidence? Should they say, I don't, I haven't had to do this before, therefore can you show me how to do it? Or is it always the employer's role to assume that they don't know? I could kiss you, honey. You will. <laughs> With that in mind, what's the tools we can have in our toolkit? Recognising we've got those challenges, and exactly that one you talk about. Whose role is it to tell us or determine the experience level, the capability, the proficiency of our staff? Number one tool for our toolkit. If we could build staff confidence to say, I don't know, I've never done this before, I need you to explain it to me more, can you please show me? No matter how old that staff member is, we're not just talking about shepherds, we're also talking about potentially 45 year old farm managers who have never done that task before. How hard is it for that person to actually go, I've never done this? It's really quite hard to actually admit that for some things. Hands up if you've, had, you've given a staff member an instruction and they've said to you, yeah, yeah, all good, all good, and they head off and it's a complete bloody balls up. Oh, funny, funny that, Ebra. <laughs> okay, hands up again if it's happened more than once. Hands up if it happened this week. I know at least one. <laughs> but you say to build confidence, but I find that's really hard because there's this culture of, I feel if I, if I ask too much, I almost insult them. I'm sorry. Yeah, almost like, insult them like if I'm you ask them. I'm continuously checking, but yep. I guess that they're not seeing that I'm really trying to proof the, the process of the jobs happening. Yeah. But I feel that they're feeling, oh God, she's nagging, or she's, she's, you know, she's making me feel belittled. Mm -hmm. Totally. So how do you create that culture, that, that open culture of saying, we're confident to say to each other how we feel about this? A, a really good question. And we, who grew up in the era, for those of us that, you know, born in the earlier years, where you didn't ask questions, staff member. The boss told you to do something, you did it. You didn't ask questions. Those that have grown up in that culture as a young person are now managing staff. And so that's in essence the culture we have continued with. Not much verbal communication, quite a bit of just telling, this is what you're going to do today, this is what we need to get done. Not a lot of asking. So when we try and introduce this culture around asking staff more questions, for example, the 35-year-old stock manager, have you ever driven you know, this John Deere before? Or have you ever done cropping before? That's, that's quite a challenging conversation to have because it is not the upbringing we've had, but it's actually what we have to start doing. Hands up for the male farmers in the room, where the, those that aim to speak more than 5,000 words a day. Who has a goal to speak less than 500? <laughs> Thank you for your honesty. Again, so that's another mental challenge. You don't want to verbally be having lots of conversations. It's not why we go farming. <laughs> but here she is up the front telling you you're going to have to start having a bit more of a chat. And ideally, yeah, that's what I'm saying. But also, let's arm ourselves with some other tools that don't just require all that verbal conversation. Okay. Whether it's build staff confidence or building culture, whatever, somehow we have to find a way of working out people's capabilities before we set them up on a task or before we have too higher expectations of what that person is capable of delivering. We can't, oops, technology. We need to stop relating age and experience to expert or competence. If 
from a task point of view. Okay, overall a person can be awesome. This far manager I talked about, top 10% performer. If I could clone him, win lotto, put him on a farm, I would. But as he rightly said himself, I felt like a bloody novice. And all it was was a task around sheep feet. But he'd never done it before. <laughs> Something to share in the back row. <laughs> I'm going to pass that on. I say, you're actually a bloody expert because <laughs> you haven't had to do it before. Tool number two for our toolkit. Get from staff what they want out of a job. Same farm manager telling me last night, oh, it's a real bugger, Amy, 18, working on the farm. She's just resigned today. How long has she been there? 12 months. Why has she resigned? She can't see what she's getting out of this job. Amy wants to be a stock manager by the time she's 25. She's a real go-getter, got huge potential. Been here 12 months. She just can't see how this job is getting her to where she wants to go. Tell me about the farm. Oh, just did scanning three weeks ago, did 200% in the Romneys. 200% in the Romneys, that's not a bad farmer. Has that girl, has Amy got plenty to learn on that farm? You would think so. In terms of setting her skills up and knowledge to be a bloody good stock manager for us, there must be learning opportunities there, but she's not seeing it. We have to talk more with staff about where are they wanting to go, and therefore, when you're on your Sunday night thinking about the week or weeks ahead, consciously go, I need to talk to Amy about why we're condition scoring the ewes this week. And I need to think about it relative to when she's stock managing, these are the skills she's going to need. Again, remember, oh, this bloody thing. Remembering she doesn't understand the why. She has no context because she's down this end. We have to provide that for her. Yep. Uh, the problem, what I find with, with uh, is when you ask them that, then they quite often tell you what you want to hear. You know? You, they tell you what you want to hear, and that's all very nice. Makes you sleep good at night, mm -hmm. but the next day you still have the same problem. Yeah. Totally. And so it's digging down to what they don't say, and I'm a, an import into New Zealand for 17 years ago, and I come from a culture where people sort of quite direct, yeah. like from the from a little island in front of the Dutch coast. So we don't beat around the bush, <laughs> we don't take prisoners either, and so you know where you stand. But here it's like very indirect. Oh, we can't say that, you know. And so for that, for us, that's an extra challenge. Absolutely. You know, to find out what's really making people tick. Yeah. Yeah. You're absolutely right, and it saddens me when I have farm staff say to me, I can't tell my boss I want to be a stock manager, because then he'll be scared, or be, I'll feel like he's worried about when I'm going to resign. So we've built that culture, a culture and it comes around non-communication, and the fact we don't want to have the conversations. Do we really believe each one of our staff will be with us for life? No, we know now they're going to leave us. So why can't we have those open and honest conversations? I'd rather get one year's notice that Ben's looking to move on to his next job than two weeks. And then I know I've got 12 months to get the most out of him. <laughs> right? So there's some benefit in a nice way. Um, there's such a positive around finding out what people's goals are and where they think they want to be, et cetera. Um, it enables us to, to, as I said, demonstrate value that they're getting out of our job with us and hopefully um, slows down the fact that they do want to leave. Number three, tool for our toolbox. Staff meetings. Hands up who runs staff meetings now with their teams. Yep, back corner. Worthwhile, why do you do it? 
Oh. Yeah, no, it's just a habit, really. We start and we talk about the rugby, and um, us probably, we're all slow thinkers, so if we uh, get together every morning like we do, eventually we come up with a plan. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. And it's a joint plan. Everyone's on the same page. What do we reckon about the dogs in the trailer? Are we all on the same page? <laughs> Who's in charge? <laughs> He's the boss. He's on the bike. He was riding. He's looking out this way. All the staff looking this way. That, that is the situation on farm a lot of the time. And it does come a little bit back to our, remember, the, the novice and that lower end, the younger people or the less experienced don't have the context. So unless the boss creates those opportunities, whether it be through staff meetings, and when I say staff meetings, 15 minutes on a Monday. What's happening for the week? Get everyone on the right page. And the same page. And 15 minutes at the end of the week to reflect on the week that's been. If the week turned to bloody custard, right, everyone knows it was custard, it is really good, it builds that whole open, honest culture to get together and all agree it was custard. But how do we make sure it's not custard next week or the next time we do this job? What do we get out of it? It's not a blame game. Can't change what's happened. Is there anything we can take out of it? We don't do enough reflection. The other thing with staff meetings I encourage you to consider is if you don't already, and get younger staff to write down what's happening for the week in a diary, or even probably they're using their cell phones <coughs> these days. Why would I recommend that whole getting people to write stuff down? Pardon? How they learn? How they learn? Absolutely. It's a, another way of taking instruction. When you write something down, generally for most people, it ingrains it. We're losing the art of recording and writing. Kids on devices and things. There's always, as a manager, you're going to have to be writing things down. You want to be able to go to them and ask their diary. You know, did you go into that paddock? What was it? They've written stuff down. It is an art that we are losing in our young people, and I just really encourage you to force them, even if it is into their phone, but to start writing more down. Don't assume they will. Paul. Oh, thanks. Tool four, whiteboards. Who's got a whiteboard in their staff room? Who's got a staff room? Yep. Valerie, why did you... Put a, have a whiteboard in the office and how do you use it? Well, I have two. I have a whiteboard for a farm map. So that's a visual for everyone yep. to understand. Uh, when I talk about things, I visualise. Um, and then there's a whiteboard for our week plan. So every day gets sort of a, a rough plan of what happens. So everyone knows. I might have told them in the meeting, but then they can always go back to it. And... It's sort of a current situation of the farm. So if I, for me, it's to know that they can go back to that if they've got questions about the plan or what the, those ewes weigh or what, how much drain was I meant to give them. Or it's really just planning and providing information. Yeah. Awesome. Things to have on the whiteboard. Oh, see, I've done it again, third time. The weekly planner. Things that maybe need to be bought when they, next time they go, you're going into town. List of R&M jobs. Perhaps health and safety. Health and safety is always a good one. What hazards have been identified out on farm this week? You take a photo of it on a Friday and store it in your computer. Big accident next week, gets investigated. You can very quickly show that health and safety is a system on your farm. You are actively talking about it and it's part of your weekly planning of how you do things. That carries huge weight. Whiteboard's one of the cheapest uh, investments you can make in terms of helping staff um, to get the best out of them and to be able to document your own thinking and planning for them to see so they get the best from you as well. 
definitely encourage people if they don't to, to look at where they could put a whiteboard and what they could put on it. <laughs> Lastly, farm maps. Who's got a farm map up on the board, whether it be a whiteboard or just a board, a big blowing up one that everyone can see? Yeah, about half. Who has farm maps on paper? A pad of farm maps. Yep, back corner there, Shona. Can you tell us why you've got them? I'm probably a bit behind the times, probably. I'm um, just trying to update to um, electronic mapping, um, make it a bit easier. But um, yeah, it, it gives a reference for a young person if we're talking about paddock names and and um, all the above, really. Okay. Not just for young people, contractors. Well, yeah, everyone. Obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. But yeah very uses. important, uh, especially when somebody's starting out on your property, to give them uh, some reference points and and get them familiar with the property. A absolutely. Again, huge value, cheap tool to provide, uh, whether it's for young staff or um, contractors, not so young staff coming to join your team. If I wanted to send you into town and I rattled off, right, we're going to go out from here and turn left, then you're going to head down Addington Road, then we're going to turn onto Musgrove Road and third right at the... Uh, if I, are you still with me? No. If I actually talked through and showed you, right, this is where we're getting to, and this is sort of the route I've taken before, and it, we show it on a map, because when you hear things verbally, our brains, for most of us, naturally try and create a picture. I'm trying to work out, when you said go to the hill paddock, already I'm trying to work out which way I go and cut through while you're just talk, giving me the next instruction. So visually, not only giving some verbal information, but backing it up with a, in this case, a farm map and showing on it is hugely valuable. Do staff want to muck up? No. Hands up if you've ever said about a staff member, I wish he, he or she would use their bloody initiative. <laughs> yeah, be honest. Most, most bosses do at some point. Between whiteboards and farm maps, we're equipping staff with information so they can take the initiative. If we go back to the whiteboard one, for example, the list of R&M jobs, how many times I've heard from staff, I come back at Habas 4, you know, I've got an hour left, I have no idea what I should go and do. I know the boss is going to be peeved with me if I don't do anything, but I don't know what I should go and do, and I don't want to get it wrong. So I'm getting the time here. Finally, just to sum up, so we've gone through five tools. I haven't done very well about putting the toolboxes up. That challenging situation you talk to your peer about, just very quickly, was there anything in those five tools you think could have been useful in helping you with that to either prevent or manage that challenging situation? Just quickly talk to your partner. Right, any pearls out of that? Who felt one of the tools might be useful? I've seen some nodding. No? Smiling? Today it's all about the people and I think even for many of the sessions that we've all attended, it's been a lot about relationships and about the people. So I'll just sort of finish where I started and say we have to look at consciously managing 
our people, drawing on a range of tools to get the best out of them. Um, at, at the start, you also said you were developing some materials for uh, for for some uh, for us or for some for farmers as well at the moment. Or is there what 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 would you refer? To? What would be useful stuff for us to find on the web and use? From RMPP? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we're doing, I'm personally doing quite a bit in the farm succession, transition or entry to farm, owner, uh, farm business ownership space. So from July there'll be quite a bit uh, real family case studies, uh, videos, uh, animation stories, fact sheets, so quite a bit in the uh, succession area. Um, we don't have anything specific around staff management. Beef and Lamb New Zealand have an HR toolkit. Um, for those that haven't looked at it, it's got some great stuff in it. So, yeah. Thank you. So we've got to wrap it up there. So thanks, Mel. Thanks for your insight and your experience around um, the gnarly subject of uh, getting the best out of our staff. So, uh, so we'll wrap it up now, but I'd just like everyone to show their appreciation, please.